Yeah? Great. Hello. Good afternoon. <laughs> oh, they can hear me. Keep talking. No. That's very sad. Oh, okay. We can't hear Jessica. So, yeah, we're, all right, wait, wait. Okay, yeah, there you are. Hey. <laughs> <laughs> Thank y'all for being patient. Hi. Good. Well, hi. Uh, good afternoon. Y'all are really, oh, very impressive. Good looking folks. Thank you for being here. My name is Jessica Norwood. I am the founder of The Runway Project. Uh, the Runway Project solves this friends and family gap for African-American entrepreneurs. And I like to describe it, <clears throat> you know, when you've got a really great idea for your business and everybody's like, yeah, lovely idea. Call your friends and family. But then when we climb into this racial wealth gap that we're here to talk about, we realize the disparity between that. And so something that seems really benign, very possible for everybody, isn't actually really possible. In fact, the wealth gap for African-American entrepreneurs, so somewhere around $11,000 in comparison to whites, it's $142,000. So that means that if you're starting this idea, you may not have your friends or family to go to to help you capitalize your business in the earliest stages. And so you would come to me, and I would be your friend and family. And I'm here joined by my lovely partner in everything, Conda Mason, who helps us with strategic partnerships. When we started this panel, I had this idea, and maybe I was drawn to the point around being at a place in my life where I'm really valuing the wisdom keepers, folks who have been doing the work, who put a lot of rigor, a lot of skill into, the, into what they've been doing. And for me, nobody better exemplifies that than Deborah Fries and Mark Watson, who are sitting to the end. They run the Boston Impact Initiative, and what I hope to do today was to talk, a little, talk to them a little bit about really what the vision is around the Boston Impact Initiative, but more of the heart of why they do this. Why would they have a fund that is explicitly dealing with closing and addressing the racial wealth gap? And so this is an opportunity for us to maybe turn the tables a little bit to our partners and talk about why they're here doing this work. So I'm gonna start there, if that's cool. So tell us a, a little bit more, just so we get the context about Boston Impact Initiative, Boston Impact Fund, a little bit more about the details of that, and then we wanna go into the conversation. Great. So I founded the Boston Impact Initiative back in 2013, and at first it was a privately held LLC because we had a hypothesis that it is possible to take a place-based approach, so Eastern Massachusetts, using integrated capital, blended finance, layering equity, debt, and grants in combination to close the racial wealth divide in our community. And we live in the number one most unequal city by income in the country, and that is absolutely built around race. So that was the issue we wanted to solve to create a healthy and resilient Boston. And we deployed uh, three million across 30 different investments. And at the end of which we said, yep, you can do this, but we need to do it differently. It has to be this blended capital going in, debt and grants, and going out. Equity, debt, grants, royalties, warranties. What happens if we put relationship, long-term relationship with an enterprise at the center of our work? and we bring whatever capital we have to bear, social capital, financial capital, every kind of financial capital, in order to support that enterprise as it develops. So we then said the pilot was a success, and we created a 501c3 charitable loan fund last year, and we're raising $10 million to deploy other people's money, debt, and grants into this same strategy. Part of the way that we chose to do that was even to change the way that we solicit the capital. So we are able to engage non-accredited investors. In our case, it will mostly be faith-based institutions in the same communities that we're deploying the capital, which is unusual. They get to participate in this process, as well as accredited investors and philanthropic capital. We've engaged all the stakeholders from the investment side 
to, to work on this project with us. <coughs> on the deployment side, in addition to providing blended capital in the ways that the entrepreneurs need it, we also invoke what we call non-financial uh, social covenants. So these are covenants that are binding, equally as binding as debt repayment schedules, where the entrepreneur commits to relating to the community that they are working in in a different way. So they might be locally sourcing 30% or locally hiring or providing living wages or instituting an ESOP program. So these are in every deal that we've done. We've closed just over uh, a million two uh, in transactions so far. But it's, again, a whole new model and an approach for addressing a very uh, tough issue. That's really, you know, what I, I love that when you all talk about the model that you have, it's so holistic. It's, it's, it's completely comprehensive in a nature. It's just not kind of checking a box. And so I love the thought that has gone into it and the effort and, and the, the innovation in it. And I think about all of us here at SOCAP, right? We come to SOCAP, I don't know, many of you have been here years before, I know I have. And we have the conversation about the racial wealth gap. We have the conversation about how to change our, our money, how to change, how to, how to make changes in this area. And yet, the gap is getting bigger and bigger. Nothing is changing, really. Very little is changing. And yet, we have these same conversations over and over mm -hmm. every year. And I really am wondering, what is it? What is it that is missing? How are we missing the mark when this is why we're here, supposedly, is to change the way we do finance? And yet, the gap just gets wider and wider. OK, so let's really go into that and I go really underneath it. So my, my background is in systems thinking. And systems, living systems, self-organize. Um, and the, in the case of human systems, we organize around a self. And that, so self-organizing, we organize around a self. And, and, and for human systems, that is a set of values and beliefs. And so I believe that we are shifting, we're not there yet though, from what I would call an economics of separation to an economics of relationship. And those of us who are in the impact investing and the social entrepreneurship space, we're trying to move toward this new world, but we haven't actually recognized how deeply immersed we are in the values and beliefs of the economics of separation. Right, so how I would articulate that is these beliefs. We are self-focused, rugged individualists. Our biological reality is survival of the fittest. Right? Competition is our natural state, which means that some of us work harder and are smarter and therefore earn what we gain, and others are lazy and less capable and they need our help, which gives rise to philanthropy. Right? He who wins the competition has the right to accumulate, and nature is here to serve our needs and support our growth. So I'm not saying we're all, that's all that we are, but there is a dominant narrative in our culture that is about individuals and competition and accumulation. And what happens is we're out there trying to change the world and we're still operating from individualism and competition and accumulation in our social enterprises and in our impact investing. And so we get more of the same. We get a little bit better, right? We are doing, definitely we are doing incremental change work. There's no question that we're nailing it on incremental change. And maybe there's transformative change from time to time. But to truly deal with transformative change, the system that we're in has to organize around a different set of values and beliefs. And the values and beliefs of an economics of, re of relationship are that we are fundamentally interdependent. We move from competition to cooperation. That we think about resources that flow instead of accumulate. So this is where recognizing that nature is our teacher, the wisdom of nature. And in nature, when resources accumulate, it's called stagnation, right. right? Nature, resources flow. They're meant to move through the ecosystem to where they're needed most. So now when we ask the question back to the impact investing and social entrepreneurship sector, is flow at the heart of your financial model, right? right. Is cooperation a higher value than competition in your business model? If it's not, you're staying in the economics of separation and we're getting more of the same. That's wonderful, and it's like, I, what I'm hearing you say too is that 
if we were to actually align our values and our activity in alignment with how nature works, that there would be different outcomes. Because we, I mean, one of the things we know is that we are living on something like seven Earths, and we only have really one. And so we know we have overshot, we're overshooting. And, and, and I want to bring this back to social justice because there is not a, ec a ecological issue that does not have a corresponding social justice issue. Is that right? Would you agree with that? 100%. So, so here we are back on how do we match our investment and, and the way that we see money and the way that we deal with money uh, in alignment with actual transformation in, with a social justice lens. Mm -hmm. And Tonda, if I might add, um, a lot of our products, all of us are involved in these, are market rate return. We use this term market rate. Yeah. And I just wanted to tie it back to Deborah's comment where there's an assumption that market rate actually, on our part, is, is exploitive. It's an extractive threshold. If you're extracting, who are the casualties? So our fund is actually trying to redeploy some of those excess returns back into the communities that, where they were extracted in the first place. So I mean, this is a, a connected logic, and I just wanted to highlight that. That's wonderful. And, and let me add in, uh, going back to this notion of biomimicry or learning from nature, right? right. If we want to think about returns, and you know, we get in these debates about market rate or concessionary, what's the basis of that debate? It's looking <laughs> backward at returns. So what is a fundamental shift in the way we think about risk and return? So one way to think about return that I'm doing, we're doing in our place, is um, so a mature hardwood forest in New England grows at a rate of 4% a year. There's something from nature. A bamboo forest grows at a rate of 35% a year and colonizes everything it's in its path, wiping out other subspecies. That should sound a little bit familiar <laughs> in the way that we treat people in our communities. So how do we think about returns and how do we think about justice and how do we think about inclusion? We have to start thinking like healthy ecosystems and not like extractive industrialists. And it feels like we're also talking about, yeah, right? We're, you're fundamentally talking about a shift, a mind shift. I mean, our entire, the way that we, our worldview um, it's a heart-mind shift that, that we're talking about because right now these values that we are, that we are living by and, and doing business by and investing by are not connected with this heart-mind that we're talking about right. because deep caring, deep, deep empathy, deep compassion, deep love for each other and actually shifting and allowing, can you imagine if we allowed those values to lead the way we invest, maybe that's what the problem is. I mean, when I see it, I really know that we are talking about there really has to be a fundamental shift in the way that we see things. Mm -hmm. And otherwise, it's Band-Aids. We're great at Band-Aids. We're great at, at walking by a homeless person and putting, you know, and feeling like you put a dollar in the can and you think, well, you know, you've done something, when fundamentally, there should be no homeless person on the street. Right? There's systems changes that need to take place. And how do we, with the capital and resources that we have, actually make systems changes? And that is what I see BII, what you all are doing, and what we're doing with the runway project. I mean, we have a systems problem when we talk about the, the statistics that they just said earlier about the wealth gap. Another statistic is that it would take 228 years for a black family's wealth to reach a white family's wealth. If the white family stayed static, it would take 228 years. That is crazy. And that is the system that we, with the Runway Project, are working with in terms of filling in that gap for the friends and family money that just doesn't exist. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I, I would also say in that, you know, we're, we're using or we're talking about this from what we can learn from nature or what we can learn about um, how our natural sort of um, ecology will really move. But I think that there, the question that I have inside of this 
cases, all right, so we have some examples of some places that we can look to learn from why aren't we doing that? Like really what's happening? And, and is there a tension around race? inside of that. Like, I just have to name it really explicitly. Like, we keep saying, quote, racial wealth gap, but we don't act, and we put a lot of the finance stuff ahead of this conversation that we just don't have that has to do with race. So I'm wondering where the two things marry around what we can learn from, from, the, from the environment, what can we can learn from nature, what we can learn from how things move, and how we do the heavy work around talking about something like race inside of that. Yeah. So I think we have got to look at the position of, we have to talk about power. We cannot talk about the wealth divide without talking about power. Mm -hmm. yep. And the question of how attached folks are, particularly white folks, right, to holding on to power and when we start to move toward, you know, racial justice has gone into the main stage, right? I mean, we're, here we are talking about this. But it tends to mean diversity and inclusion initiatives, right. which is a fraction. It's a necessary but way insufficient shift for us to actually take any ground in a meaningful way on the issue of racism and racial justice. And so we have to start talking about power meaning who's making decisions about the allocation of capital, mm -hmm. right? And that's part of, you know, for example, our fund is majority governed by community-based organizations so that we are not the ones sitting in an ivory tower making all the decisions. We partner with another fund that's participatory democracy and decision-making. So I think one of the issues is we can start talking about racial justice work and closing the racial wealth divide, and if all we're doing is writing checks differently, we're not gonna take ground. We have to talk about seeding power and transitioning power, same thing, from where it's accumulated to where it's been extracted from. And white folks need to do that work. Yes. I would add to that, uh, and this might be controversial, but, but my belief is that the U.S. is moving toward financial apartheid, mm -hmm. where, where you have a browning of the population and the resources are puddling in a very small part of the community and the, one of the ways to deal with that is to change who the decision makers who allocate capital. So my challenge, and, and I've been in the investment business for 30 plus <coughs> years at all levels of the business, is for everybody in this room to consider within your own organizations, who's making the decisions about allocating capital? What screens or what, what biases are built in? We all have them. But part of that, I mean, we have to start there to to turn around this apartheid scenario. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, absolutely. I, I, w what I do love about what you're doing is the strong part about really pushing against these places where power is being held up and how that is actually disrupting this flow of capital from us living into this piece around these values uh, um, that, we, that we have. And so I'm thinking about I'm thinking about where we show up as a community of folks here at, from SOCAP in this conversation. Is, pardon me, you can't hear yeah. me. So sorry, I'm back. Okay, there you go. <laughs> this microphone is falling here, sorry. But I'm thinking about where we as a community here who gather at SOCAP start to engage this question this week. We're opening this up engage this question this week around power dynamics and engage this question about how we're, we're looking at building our work inside of this more natural kind of flow that happens. What kind of work would you have us do as a community here? We're all assembled here. We all imagining wanting to really challenge. We're here to show up to do this good work. What are we saying, and I'm gonna throw you into this as well, what are we saying to this group of folks about what it means to be doing work to close the racial wealth gap? Something very practical that, yeah. that we want people to start yeah. leaning into. Yeah, well, the, one of the first things that comes up for me is that we have to do some internal work. Mm. Because externally, we, again, the Band-Aid situation, which we do often and we do really well, 
But if we don't do an internal investigation within ourselves and really change some fundamental and look at the own, our own participation in, in, in racism in America and white supremacy in America, if we don't start looking at that and really um, you know, being able to, to be honest, then because what happens is that there's so much benefit by not looking at it, seemingly benefit. Although I don't believe that anybody's winning. I really believe that it's a lose-lose situation that we're in, though there are those that seemingly are winning, but nobody's really winning. Yeah. When the air, you can't breathe the air, when, you know, all the, all the things that we share. And until we can fundamentally understand that we are deeply interconnected, not only to each other, but to the planet as well, that we are nature, <laughs> that we fundamentally are nature walking and breathing, until we understand that deep interconnection, then the exploitative mindset of me, 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 mine, mine, my, I, 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 will continue to, to lead in everything that we do. And we see the results of what we get from that. And so I really think that a deep understanding of our deep interconnection and is fundamentally important as, as, as step one, mm -hmm. um, really seeing that differently because we have, we have separated ourselves. When you talk about separation, we've separated ourselves from our own selves, from our own soul. We separate ourselves from each other, certainly from the planet, you know, if we could trash it the way that we do. Mm -hmm. And so I just really think that that's a really fundamental change yeah. that needs to happen. Yeah. So if we had more time, um, we would probably ask you to sit and notice what is the narrative in your head that says, this is why I can't make the shift, mm -hmm. right? So, so people in our space, impact investors are like, well, there aren't any black and brown owned businesses to invest in or foundations who are trying to find fund managers who are inclusive. Oh, well, there aren't any black and brown fund managers with track records out there. Check the narrative because it's actually false. <laughs> so you may not be in relationship with the folks that you need to be in relationship with, but there are abundant people, talent, skills, enterprises, creativity, all of that is out there. We're not looking in the places that we need to look, which means check the narrative, find out what the objection is, and then go back to the belief system underneath and talk to someone about it. At least be witnessed in the practice of finding out what narrative did I inherit, it from, inherit from this culture that I could choose to walk out of and step into relationship with others to really begin to explore. We have no shortage of pipeline. We have great businesses to invest in. We do too. So it's possible. No shortage of pipeline. No shortage of pipeline. Uh, my, my quick um, thought would be, look at who you're not investing in. Look at who's not showing up in your pipeline. Look at what investors are not investing in your fund and, and understand the reasons why. And that's sort of the canary in the coal mine to sort of trigger where where in your organization there are blocks against groups or sectors or gender or whatever. But that's one. We actually have done this process ourselves internally. I mean, we're, we're a racial justice fund, and we had an introspective look. So I would encourage people to run that process themselves. Mm -hmm. and, and it's not OK to stay with the status quo. We have to get to the point to where not only are we concerned about it, but oh well, and keep going. We have to say it's fundamentally not OK. I cannot continue the way what this portfolio looks like. I cannot continue because I am supporting something that I know is detrimental to the planet, to each other, and that is not going to fundamentally get us where we need to go. And so we have to really make it so that it's just not OK. We can't just glaze it over and wish it were different. It takes effort, it takes relationship building, it takes comfort coming out of your comfort zone, going into a place of discomfort, which is where the learning happens, which is where the juicy part of life is, is in that little discomfort zone. It takes being able to do that and being willing to do that and being committed to a different world. Because as long as we're committed, we will have that lens on everything we do. And if we're not committed, it will be a check the box 
and we'll go about our business and say it's okay. And it's really, it's not okay. That's right. Well, I, w I wanna thank you, uh, all of you, for being um, my guest on my panel. And I also wanna let all of you know, Runway is always looking for folks who'd like to support and work with us. Uh, we are currently raising monies now, and so please find us, talk to us. Right, right. And, um, and if you'd also like to talk to us about how we're doing what we're doing and the possibility of doing that in your area, we love those conversations as well. So thank you so much. Enjoy your SOCAP. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you.